go through the book two times today. This is the final lesson of 20 lessons on the book of Philippians. We've looked at a lot of details, and my objective today is to look at the overview. And um, let's pray, and then we will begin. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the inspired word that you have given us. You've breathed out this word through holy men, and I thank you, Father, it is truth. May we mix our faith with your word today and get a comprehension and understanding of what Paul is writing, what the Philippians were receiving, and what we can take home for our own Christian life, that we may be a brighter and brighter light for our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name I pray, amen. So I invite you to open your Bibles to Philippians. Pastor announced at the end of last hour that next week we'll be starting the book of James. So we're going to go through the book of James verse by verse, and today is the last one on the book of Philippians. Again, you should have a yellow handout. And uh, Philippians is a great book. I'm not sure how many sessions you as an individual have sat in through these 20 lessons, but I have sat in on most of them. It's been very enjoyable to hear the different teachers, and Paul was used of the Lord to write a great book. Paul, with Silas and Timothy, evangelized the church in Philippi, or the city of Philippi, and it's all recorded in Acts chapter 16. And from the Philippian jailer to Lydia to others, he had ministered to them directly and indirectly for years. This book that Paul writes, he writes it very lovingly to the believers as he writes from a prison cell in Rome. Paul loves the Philippians and the Philippians love Paul. They were striving together for the faith of the gospel. They were sacrificing for each other and they were being used of the Lord to bring honor and glory to his name. It's an encouraging book. It's an edifying book. It's a convicting book, and it's a very practical book that you and I can pick up some principles, verses, truth, and understanding to apply directly to our own lives. As you see on your handout there, just a few highlights I want to go over. I reviewed every um, <clears throat> one of the uh, outlines that we looked at over this last period, and after examining them, I decided, you know what, with consult from Pastor Roxer to just have a simplified outline here that you would be able to use on your own and read through and some basic facts to go over. When was this written? Approximately 60 to 62 AD. It was written from a prison cell. That's the context. And it was written at the same time as Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. Paul is in a prison cell. He is rejoicing in his Savior. He is passing on that rejoicing to the Colossians. He's focused upon getting the message out to the lost world, even though he's wrapped up in a confined cell. How many of us would be in that position? Thinking of others when we're locked up behind bars. Well, by the grace of God, through an eternal perspective, Walking by faith, Paul can be used to do this. Now, there are some key words if you look on your handout there, and I categorize them along with him, the Lord, Christ, and or Jesus Christ together about 55 times in this book. Just amazing going over about Jesus Christ. Look at verse 1, if you would. Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy... Bond servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. First verse gives you an indication he mentions Jesus Christ twice. Please turn to chapter 4, verse 23. Last verse of the book. He says, The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Opens with Jesus Christ. Ends with Jesus Christ and His grace. And in between, a whole lot more about the Lord. Also, key words here, we see rejoice. Turn with me back to chapter 1, please, and look at verse 4. Chapter 1, verse 4. 
always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. Now, prayer is hard work. Laboring prayer is hard work. And he says, I'm praying for you with joy. Joy is delight of your inner man. Delight of your spirit. You are delighted. You're thrilled. I'm rejoicing in the Lord. I'm thrilled over and over again with him. So we see rejoice. We see joy 15 times. Drop to verse 18 of chapter 1, please. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice. Yes, and will rejoice. When Jesus Christ is preached, Paul was rejoicing. We can be in fellowship with him. When we hear stories from uh, the jail or from down in uh, courtsite or our friends or we have opportunities, we can delight again, rejoice that the Lord is being preached. Again, throughout this book, chapter 3, verse 1, please. Chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Chapter 4, verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. In between all of his joy and rejoicing, it's Jesus Christ. A great reason by faith to rejoice. Again, over and over in this book, he's speaking about his Savior. Look at verse 10 of chapter 4. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again though you surely did care but you lacked opportunity so he's joying in the lord rejoicing in the lord because the philippians cared for him why because god is working through those believers therefore he rejoices in the lord who is having his way or sway in their lives again next word on your keywords is mind or thinking Paul had the proper biblical orientation upon truth, and he was trying to pass that on to the Philippians. Chapter 1, please, and look at verse 27. One of the key verses to the book, chapter 1, verse 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. Paul had a single-mindedness for the Lord's will and his glory. He wanted that for the Philippians. Together, when you and I think together, we have the common value system, we have fellowship. And when our fellowship is common with the Word of God, we have fellowship with the Lord. That's his objective. He loved those people. They loved him. He sacrificed for them. They sacrificed for him. And they thought the same. That's where you can have joy. You can have joy in a relationship at home. You can have joy in a relationship at work. You can have joy in the military or whatever when you're thinking the same for a common purpose. When a husband and wife is thinking like that, they have joy and rejoicing. When two fellow believers have that, they are joy and rejoicing. And that's what Paul is saying over and over again. This joy and this thinking because of our mindset. Chapter 2, verse 2, he says this. Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. There is joy in thinking together, oriented, oriented to the biblical truth of Scripture, to the grace of God and to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Again, repeatedly, over and over. Chapter 3, please, with me. To see the same thing again about mind and thinking. There's all sorts of verses, like I said here, about 13 of them. But chapter 3, verse 15. Therefore... Let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. What kind of mind? An eternal thinking, a pursuit of Jesus Christ. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, 
the standard, the Word of God. Let us be of the same mind. Again, this unity of thinking he had with the Philippians, and it responded with joy, or it resulted in joy within there. Now again, the gospel is mentioned over and over again. Back to chapter 1, please. I'd like to look at this. You notice I didn't even put a PowerPoint together. I want us just to look at this chapter or this uh, section of book over and over again. So we have here in uh, chapter 1, the gospel, verse 5. For your fellowship, now that's again common thinking, in the gospel from the first day until now. Paul had joy that they had fellowship together in the gospel from the first day. Where is that? Back in Acts chapter 16. Up until now, they're on common ground, common thinking. A great thing to pray for us as individuals and as a local church that we'd have unity around common doctrine, beliefs, and purpose, all centered in Jesus Christ and the grace of God. Verse 12, chapter 1. <clears throat> but I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, verse 18. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I do rejoice. Actually, it's at the end of verse 17. Excuse me. I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. So you can make that note on your um, uh, handout there that uh, it's, the gospel is in verse 17, not 18. Pardon me. Chapter 2, oh, it's not on yours. That's, <laughs> sorry, verse 22. <laughs> verse 22, chapter 2, verse 22. But you know his proven character. He's talking about Timothy. You know his proven character that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. So again, these are some of the key words, the repeated words, which emphasizes or communicates the emphasis of the book. We see Jesus Christ, Paul and the Philippians rejoicing because their thinking was together, and it all centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now I might note that it was a very warm tone. He didn't have to rebuke. He didn't have to correct them. He was simply saying, let's go together forward. Come on with me. If you'll find one of the key words I didn't mention, I thought about it, but I didn't, the word let. You'll see it over and over again. Let us, let us, let's go forward. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know what that is? It's the appeal of grace. It's not a command in the sense of it's a let us. Let's go forward. He's appealing to them. Very warm tone. And as I mentioned to you, he sacrificed for these Philippians. He was sent to jail with many whips or stripes on his back, and he sacrificially gave for their service, and they then responded and gave sacrificially financially for his work and furtherance of the gospel. Turn with me to chapter 1, please, verse 7. When he opens up this book, Paul talks about his prayers for them and his affection for them. I'm going to read verse 7 and 8 of chapter 1. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart. I have you in my heart. Inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. You're in my heart. We're, we're, we're striving about the gospel and we're all partakers of God's grace. Verse 8, for God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. Oh, I'm sitting here and there in this stinky cell. I have a few freedoms, but not a lot. But you know what? My affections are to be with you all. My friends, is it hard for you to express your heart to others? I would appeal to you to think how you can express your love to your family, your fellow believers, oh, thank you so much for sacrificing for Jesus. That is so encouraging for me. I had a conversation here this last week in my uh, office. There's an individual came in and talked to me. 
And over the period of the conversation, I listened and I, this, we discussed and I shared some principles. And when it was over, I just wanted to say, uh, the person was a little discouraged. And I said, you know, you are such an encouragement to me. Because God had brought them along from their um, bondage of sin and difficulties. And step by step, they had responded to the Lord. People here had ministered to them. And I just wanted to say, I am so encouraged how the Lord has brought you along. You are such an encouragement to me. Simply because you've responded to the Lord and your life is a reflection of Jesus Christ a little bit more. Your candle is burning a little bit more each year for Jesus Christ more brightly. And I am encouraged by that. There, were, there was a time in my life I could hardly tell people that I loved them or that I cared for them. But over the years, you walk with the Lord, you ask him to give you that love for others, and you can, by the grace of God, learn to express it. It's very endearing. It's very um, encouraging. And so I encourage you, like Paul here, I love you people. I want, you're in my heart, and I greatly long for you. Look how he ends the book, please. Chapter 4. We'll look at verse 21 and 22. 21 and 22, and he says this, Greet every saint in Christ Jesus, and the brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. So he's saying, I want to greet everybody, and the saints here greet you. So make sure we, you say hi to everyone for us. A very endearing way to end the book. One verse about his endearing, chapter 4, verse 1. Look at the words he uses about the Philippians. Therefore, my beloved, chapter 4, verse 1, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, beloved. Look at those words. It sounds almost like a husband to a wife or a wife to her husband. Beloved, longed for, brethren, my joy, my crown. One little encouragement, actually it's in the imperative, stand fast in the Lord. Beloved. Oh, that is so precious, the way he's talking to them. You'll see there in D on your handout, emphasis, the theme. Without, going, without saying it, I've been repeating it, but it's just rejoicing in the Lord with unified doctrinal convictions. Their mindset or thinking was the same. So as a purpose of that thinking and Jesus is to strive together for the faith of the gospel. Their correct thinking had a purpose to further Jesus Christ and his message of the gospel. Now, you'll see I included just a simple little book chart there for you. Rejoicing in Jesus Christ in the gospel. Say one of the theme verses is rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, 4-4. Four, four. Then you'll see I divided just by chapters. Rejoice in Jesus Christ our life. Verse 121 is, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We read verse 27 already. Rejoice in the Lord, our example, chapter 2. And he says, Jesus Christ, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Rejoice in Jesus Christ, our pursuit. That's what we're pursuing here. It's an eternal pursuit, chapter 3. Read this with me, if you would, or follow along as I read, chapter 3, verse 14. <clears throat> I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's the summation of the last seven or eight verses. That's my life. I'm in prison, but I'm pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. And lastly, rejoice in Jesus Christ, our sufficiency. Key verse there is, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Same thing. It's all about what we have in Jesus Christ centered around a purpose of getting this message out. 
So, are you wearing Paul's sandals yet? What I mean by, are you walking in his footsteps? Because the context is laid helps to understand or comprehend the writer's intent to the audience. So we have Paul here in prison, longing to be with the Philippian believers whom he sacrificed and whom they have been sacrificing for him. <clears throat> and as I mentioned earlier, we have a very simplified outline here. And as I read the book, we're gonna, I'll just reflect on this outline. And I think this outline will help you on your own. I rode up to the uh, retreat, and I have a Bible on CD, and I listened to this six times yesterday, three times on the way up, three times on the way back. All week I've been reading the book. It takes about 11 minutes to read the book of Philippians. We've been studying it for about four and a half months. Can I ask you how many times have you read through it from beginning to end? Let's try it here. <clears throat> Starting in chapter 1, verse 1, it's a greeting, 1 and 2. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in the next eight verses, he expresses his love for these fellow believers. First in thanksgiving, verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine making request for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now being confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of jesus christ he's thanking him for these believers for their fellowship in the gospel for every remembrance of them <clears throat> and here's where he express, expresses his heart verse 7 and 8 just as it is right for me to think this of you all because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. <clears throat> for God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. The way Jesus Christ loves us, that's the type of affection I have for you Philippians, is what he is saying. Then he describes his prayers. Now he says, this is how I'm praying for you, verse 9. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent in your life, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Jesus Christ. Your testimony would be impeccable, verse 11. Being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ, Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. So when these things become real in your life, your love abounding, your discernment is increasing, and your life is impeccable, and fruits are of righteousness, then it will be to the praise and the glory of God. That's my prayer. Woo, what a great prayer that we can pray for one another here. Now, he talks about advancing the gospel with rejoicing. Now remember he's in prison and get a hold of him, his perspective, verse 12 through 18. But I want you to know, my fellow Philippian brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. I can give thanks and everything because God's working it together for good. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice, as I put salve on my uh, wounds or on the uh, chains that are rubbing against my shackles, against my legs. He then turns and he says, I want, to know, I want you to know that I want Christ magnified in my body, whether by life 
or by death. Look at the third word in verse 19. For I know. May I ask you, how deep are your convictions? Paul, throughout this book, he says, I know, I know, I know. The deeper your convictions, the more settled your heart will be. For the truth of God, if your convictions, of course, are built upon the word of God, can settle your heart. I'm anchored to this truth. I know whom I have believed, Paul said later in 2 Timothy. But we can know we're saved. We can know God's will in our life based upon the truth of the word. So here we go, verse 19. Why did he want Christ magnified? He wanted it because that was his life. He was his life and death. For I know that this will turn out for my deliverance through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now Christ, also Christ will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death, in freedom or in prison. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Oh, that I want to be able to say that, my friends. That's a hard saying. I like the little bumper stickers people said. Sailing is life. Hunting is life. Something is life. No, Jesus Christ is life. And Paul says, I know it. I want him magnified, whether in life or death, because to me to live is Christ. Verse 22. But if I live in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose... I cannot tell. For I am hard-pressed between the two, having a desire to, to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. I love you so much, it's needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ, by my coming to you. So my heart wants to be with my Savior who is my life, but you know it's more needful, and I know that I'm going to be able to stay here for the progress of the gospel and the faith in your life. How often do you think about living your life for the betterment of others, for the benevolence of others? That's the mindset the scriptures have. I want to live for you, Lord, and for others. And then I'll think about myself. It's a supernatural. Now in verse 27, we see here he's appealing to them to walk worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's appealing to their walk to be similar with his. Only let, do you remember that word let? Appeal of grace. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs, that you stand fast in one spirit with one thinking, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you, if <clears throat> for to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me while I was in Philippi, and you now hear is in me while I'm here in Rome. So I want your life to match up with the gospel, worthy, to weigh equal in with the message of the gospel. If your testimony is not reflective of your message, people will say, hypocrite! And so he appeals to them, to their walk, to be worthy, and even when it comes to suffering for Christ. We don't desire that, but it's part of the package. And it brings honor and glory to our Savior and his name. So Paul is admonishing these believers. He's appealing to them to come forward with him, to move forward and align their life with the gospel. Now, he gets to chapter 2. And he's rejoicing in Jesus Christ, our example. Focused on Jesus Christ, the mindset he arranges first for the four verses, then he appeals to us according to Jesus Christ, and then he has three more examples along with it. Verse 1. Therefore, there is an, there, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, 
having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. And let me give you a prime example. And he's going to elaborate about Jesus Christ. There's the word again. If you look at the beginning of verse 3, beginning of verse 4, beginning of verse 5, let. He doesn't need to rebuke them. They're already moving forward. He doesn't need to admonish them directly. They're moving forward. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. However, therefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name, and that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those in earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <clears throat> now, he, he's setting up Jesus Christ as our proper thinking, proper willingness to yield himself over as a sacrifice for others and for the glory of God. Then he says, and he applies directly, and you could put in your notes here, um, under 12 through 16, you can see he says, you work out your own salvation. So here's a personal appeal, a personal appeal to believe and follow Christ's example. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ and that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. This walk with Jesus Christ, this thinking correctly, is hard work. Now, what do I mean there? I mean, you work out your own salvation by grace, through faith, but it doesn't come naturally. You have the world against you. You have Satan against you. You have your sin nature against you. You have the grace of God, you have the Spirit of God, you have the Word of God, you have the Son of God, all with you, encouraging, strengthening, enabling. But it's a battle at times. That's why he's saying, work it out. It's second tense. It's not going to heaven. It's our sanctification. Work this out with respect or fear and trembling before God, and then follow with obedience. Do all things without complaining and murmuring or disputing. So we see here our great example of Jesus Christ, and now he lists three more examples, including himself. Verse 17, Yes, if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all for the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. Now isn't that an eternal supernatural mindset? He's joined, rejoicing, he's glad because his body is a poured out sacrifice for others. And it's going to bring honor and glory to Christ. Now in verse 19 he switches and he is using Timothy as our example. Timothy is an example for us of the care of fellow saints. He's an elder in a sense of being watchful over the churches and he says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all naturally seek their own, not the things which are, Christ, are of Christ Jesus, but you know his proven character, that as a son with his... As his the, 
that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself shall also come shortly. Then he sets another example for them to follow. A one to serve. Epaphroditus served to the point of death as a humble servant. Yet I consider it necessary, verse 25, to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my need, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard uh, that he was sick, for indeed he was sick almost unto death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, for I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I sent him the more eagerly, that when you see him again, you may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem. Because for the work of Christ, he became close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in your service me. Hmm. Interesting. So he was a sacrificial servant that set up as an example for us, willing to serve to the point of almost death. Now we switch here in chapter 3 in verse 1, and he wants us to see how that he, to pursue things, but not according to religious works not according to his past religion or our religious efforts. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. That's how we want to start all this out, but let me, let me warn you. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh to produce righteousness or works before God. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Let me list some. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, I persecuted the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. He's clarifying. We have nothing in and of ourselves to be sufficient to serve the Lord or bring honor and glory to his name. But we rejoice in the Lord and we have confidence not in our fleshly abilities, but in his spirit and in Jesus Christ, not in our religious works. Now in verse 8, again, he is going to list from 8 to 14 how he has actively pursued the excellence of knowing Jesus Christ. Actively pursuing. Yet indeed, verse 8, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I'm pursuing, I'm pressing, I'm pushing forward. Even though you're in prison? Yes! Because the Lord is with me, his grace is sufficient, and you have been praying for me and supplying my needs. Therefore, verse 15, let us. Now again, he's appealing to them in grace, let us move forward together. Verse 15, let us, as many as are mature, 
have this mind. Which mind? Eternal mind. Which mind? The mind of Jesus Christ. Which mind? The mind that is pursuing forward to do the things of Jesus Christ. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us, you, let us be of the same mind. That's his appeal. Let's move forward, brethren. Verse 17, brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk so as you have us for a pattern. You know, when you have a, a, a fellow believer who is maybe more mature than you, maybe it's a pastor, maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's someone in a book even. You look at them and you see they're an example whom I can follow. Not that they are God, not that they are Jesus Christ, but they are a, a, an example or a reflection of God's will here on earth. And Paul is saying, follow me as an example and also note those who also walk. They are a pattern for you. Verse 18, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who set their minds on earthly things. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Follow me. Don't follow the false teachers who love themselves and have shame. You follow me and other examples because our citizenship is in heaven and we have a heavenly perspective, mindset, and pursue all around the Lord Jesus Christ. We come to chapter 4 and he says, in a sense, Jesus Christ is our sufficiency, both of us, standing in unity, verse 1. Therefore, my beloved and longed for brethren, my joy, my crown, so stand fast in the Lord. Beloved, I implore Iodia and I implore Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labor with me in the gospel, with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Some people as individuals need to be come alongside and encouraged, reproved, rebuked, move forward. And he uses some names here. But it's in the way of thinking. That's what needs to be addressed first, then behavior. <clears throat> Rejoicing in the Lord and following his will will bring you peace. Rejoice in the Lord, verse 4, always. Again I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is any pra anything praiseworthy, meditate upon these things. The things which you learn, received, and heard, and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Simple formula. Put away your anxiousness. Think upon the things of the Lord. Rejoice in Him and pray about everything. And as you meditate on those the peace of God that passes all understanding, the God of peace will support you and will give you his peace. Verse 10, we have rejoicing in the Lord when he meets your needs through others. He turns to these Philippians and he says, you have been used of the Lord and for that I rejoice. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely continually did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. 
everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, whether abounding or based, whether hungry or full. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, not one single church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but only you. For even in Thessalonica, you send aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things you sent from, from you sent, <clears throat> sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Man, his great purpose, give God the glory in all of this. Keep it coming to our God. Keep, let us keep burning brightly as a reflection of Jesus Christ and the gospel of grace. And he concludes again in verse 21 and 22. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. Oh, I love those saints, he says. The brethren who are with me, they greet you. So let's have this greeting go back and forth. All the saints greet you, but especially those who are of Caesar's household. <clears throat> you know, I'm not sure why the Caesar's household especially, apart from the fact that he was there with them day and night, he preached to them the gospel. Probably a number of them just got saved. For some reason, he says, especially, especially those who are of Caesar's household. Now, we don't know if those were actually his servants or those were his relatives. I'm not sure. But it's amazing. Right up to Caesar's household. Now probably maybe a year or, or months before this. There's no way Paul was saying. Okay. Maybe the Lord can send me to Rome. And I can witness to Caesar's household. I don't think he ever thought that. Now in his prayers he prayed for the then known world. But can you imagine what the Lord would like to do with you. As an individual. With me as an individual, to further the message of the gospel. We need to walk with him. We need to walk with him in grace, by faith, letting our testimony be transformed. See, interesting, as, as he talks about, we become a bright light, become a righteous reflection of Jesus Christ for the purpose of the furtherance of the gospel. We don't know what the year will transform what will transpire. We don't know what's going to happen in the next five years, but we can be a beacon, in a sense, a bright light for Jesus Christ, maybe even up to the president's household. Wouldn't that be amazing? It's one of us or some of us were able to go right to the White House, be able to share the gospel personally with the people within that circle. Oh, I'm sure they'd send back, hey, Thank those believers in Duluth that sent you here. I'm thrilled. They say that in Myanmar. They say that in uh, Africa. They say that in El Salvador. Thank those people who have donated or, or supported the Ministry of International Gospel Teaching. Thank them for us. That's what they say. He concludes verse 23. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. If I have any concern about you, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, that'll take care of everything. So in my concerns, in Epaphroditus, in others who are concerned about you, I'm sending this letter with the grace of God to you all. Amen. Four months or so looking at this book. It's been enjoyable. It's a really good book. I didn't get a chance to read the whole thing through once again, so I implore you to do that later on today. Maybe at half time, huh? You could read it two, three, maybe three times, huh? Okay. 
all jesting put aside. Let's bow. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your willingness to communicate to us in 66 books, and this one is surely a precious one. Thank you, Father. May we meditate day and night upon your word that we might be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that sends forth its fruit in its season, and no matter what comes along, we can stand secure abiding in Christ. Thank you for Paul and using him to write this. Even thank you for sending him to prison so he had a chance to write it. And thank you, Father, for even the Philippians that responded to Paul's teaching, and they 